to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. We learned that last night. How much light? No light in them. The second thing that we learned last night about a true prophet was that they must speak about the reality of an indwelling Christ. We read Colossians 1 verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And what's the mystery among the Gentiles? Christ in you, the hope of glory. It was the reality of an indwelling Christ. The, second, the third thing that we looked at last night was that we must also deal with separation from the world and its influences. We did not read James 4 verse 4 last night, but we could read it here where it says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. So if we are friends with the world, what are we? Enemy of God. You want to be God's enemy? Do you really understand this? So many times we as a church are facing a difficulty. The world is always trying to get in. And what do we do? Oh, we need to be friendly. But what happens when you are friendly with the world? Automatically you become what? The enemy of God. The fourth point that we looked at last night was that su prophets suffered because they refused to back down from the truth revealed to them. The fifth point that we looked at last night was that one of the things that prophets must do and their work uh, as well as other gifts in the church is to foster unity among the believers. That is one of the requirements clearly seen in Ephesians. This morning we are going to look at two more tests and evaluate why we need the spirit of prophecy today. The first one here, the sixth one actually in our series, but uh, the first one this morning. And uh, we covered a lot of this in our Sabbath school lesson today. The point is, can we use miracle working to identify true prophets? Well, we had it in our lesson, but for the sake of those who are uh, watching on the internet or something else like that, I want to cover some of these points once again, because it's very important. And it's good for us to remember them. In John chapter 10 and verse 41, we find it says, And many resorted unto him, this is unto Jesus, many were coming to Jesus, and said, John did what? John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. So everything that John pointed out about Jesus was true, but John did what? No miracle. Now, who was this John anyway? I think that Jesus would have a good knowledge of who John is, don't you think so? You think Jesus would know who John was? Okay, now what did Jesus say about John? In Luke chapter 7, and verse 26 through 28. Luke 7, 26 to 28. Jesus says, But what went ye out for to see? This is in the wilderness. A prophet? And by the way, when they asked John the Baptist, Who are you? Are you the prophet? Did John say, Yes, I'm the prophet of God? Is that what John said? No, what did he say? I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. But now, after John went off the scene, Jesus comes around and says, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. So John was not just a prophet, he was what? More than the prophet. This is he of whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. So notice here, as Jesus talks about John the Baptist, who did what? How many miracles? No miracles. And yet he is what? The greatest of the prophets, and that's declared by Christ himself. 
And don't you think that if Jesus is the greatest of the prophets, don't you think that then he would be, he would know what he's talking about? For that matter, who will make the most use of miracles in the last days? In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20, before we go to there, let me just go ahead. Can you give this to them and I'll bring it up to par where we're at. Let's go over there and bring it there. And We've got this technology finally working here with us. It's going to be Revelation chapter 19 and verse 20. It says here, and the beast was taken. Here it is now. Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that did what? That wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So, here it is, the false prophet that did what? The false prophet worked miracles. Do they have it in there yet? Okay, now, who is this going to affect? When this false prophet was doing miracles, who does it affect? Revelation 13, verse 14. We had some of these verses this morning, but let's look at it again. And deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. As we study Bible prophecy, we find that this beast in Revelation 13 that comes after the leopard-like beast is a lamb-like beast and it comes up out of the earth instead of out of the sea. We identify through Bible prophecy that that earth is the territory found right here in the United States of America. And so what it says here, and by the way, those of you who are here in the local area, at the end of September and October, we're going to be having a special prophecy series. And one of those parts will be dealing with Revelation 13. And we'll go a little bit more in detail at that time. But nonetheless, here it says, it deceived them to dwell where? On the earth. Specifically where? In the United States. How are people in America going to be deceived? What is going to be the thing to make people to make the image to the beast? Here in Protestant America, how do you do that? It is by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. Miracle working is clearly an identifying mark of the false prophet. Now, God's people will be doing miracles, I understand that. But they never do miracles to prove anything. Christ never did a miracle to prove anything. When Herod was there and he said, oh, I need some proof from you. And what does Herod say to Jesus? Oh, can you show me a miracle? And what does Jesus do? He doesn't even answer him. He's just quiet, looks at him. <laughs> not a word. Because it's not miracles on demand. Whenever there are miracles on demand, that is an identifying mark, actually not of the true prophet, but of what? Of the false prophet. When you look at these miracle workings and you test it carefully, you will see a departure from God's Word. Also, you will find a lowering of the standards. This is what we looked at last night, wasn't it? Always is associated with it, somehow is the lowering of standards, even if the miracles are real. So many times I hear about people talking about false miracles. There was a man one time, one of, these, uh, one of these miracle working preachers, and he would call people to come forward, and they would come up forward up there to listen to what he had, to, to, to accept this message. And he would come up there, whoever came forward, and he would touch them. And as he would touch them, there was a zap, and they'd fall backwards. And uh, later on they found out he had a big battery pack stretched, uh, strapped to his back. And that was the electrical current. As soon as they touched him, he zapped them. Okay, well... What happens is people look at things of that nature and say, oh, these are false miracles. But what happens when a real one happens? What happens when to every one of your senses, this is a real miracle? Are you then prepared to take your mind and say, no, I will not do this? 
I was once a attending a, um, actually it was a camp meeting up here in Northern Virginia. It was quite a few years ago, an Adventist camp meeting. And I was there with a friend of mine. There was about 5,000 people in the congregation. And uh, the preacher was talking about miracles. And finally, at the end of the service, he said, who would like to come forward here to receive their miracle? I heard this. Oh, that's interesting. And suddenly, people went to go forward. And as one lady went up forward, suddenly she began jumping up and down saying, I am healed. And what happened next I was unprepared for. Suddenly there was a rush to go to the front. What do you do when 5,000 people get up and start marching to the front and you're sitting in your seat? And there's a power saying, move up front. And my conscience says, according to the word of God, this is not the way miracle working works. And the person that came with me sat in his seat with me next to me. And can you imagine two of us alone in the seat? <laughs> not another seat was full. That's what I'm talking about here. We have to be so convinced of understanding how true miracles work that we are not going to be deceived. In Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 4, it says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth you a sign or a wonder. So here's a prophet. He gives you an actual sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass. It actually comes to pass. But he says unto you, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. What do you do then? Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Do you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul? Or are you waiting for some miracle to happen to convince you of something? I've even had people tell me, here, Show me a miracle, and then I'll believe. And then he said, oh, you're not true. You're not a true prophet. You're not a true man of God because you can't do this miracle. Show it to me right now. Didn't change my mind. Didn't make me uh, wonder, oh, I wish I could do something. No. Because when there is a need, God will help us do miracles. But we don't ever do it for those type of things. It says, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and ye shall serve Him and cleave unto Him no matter what happens. For that matter, what do you do when you identify a false prophet? Deuteronomy 13 verse 5 says, and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be what? Put to death. What do you do? Listen to him to try to convert him? No. Well, today we don't put people to death. But in Romans 16, verse 17, tells us something very important. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to which ye have learned, and what? Try to convince them? Try to become their friend? Or what? Do we understand avoiding? Do we really understand that? You know, we've kind of changed our thinking a little bit sometimes. Oh, we've got to be friend, and we've got to be this, that, and the other. It says specifically, if they are causing divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine that you have learned, you leave them alone. And I have watched people over and over again who say, oh, we've got to be friendly. We've got to do this, that, and the other. And next thing you know, they are confused with the same thing. The Bible was very clear on how to do that. Now, why are we to test the prophets? Not just by one rule, but by all the rules. Why is it? Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, we are told that no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What does Satan come as? He doesn't come to you and say, hey, I'm that dark angel, can I tempt you? Never. How does Satan come? He comes as an angel of light. 
he comes as if he has the truth. Are you and I so rooted and grounded in the truth that when an angel of light comes, we are able to say, you're the devil? Are we ready to do that? We need to be. We need to be very clear on our thinking. In Volume 2, Testings for the Church, page 171 to 172, it tells us, Satan closely watches events. And when he finds one who has a specially strong spirit of opposition of the, to the truth of God, he will even reveal to him unfulfilled events. Why? That he may more firmly secure himself a seat in his heart. So someone is opposing the truth and suddenly they get a revelation of a future event. And the devil says, see, you're the man of God. <clears throat> he who did not hesitate to brave a conflict with him who holds creation as in his hand has malignity to persecute and deceive. He holds mortals in his snare at the present time. During his experience of nearly 6,000 years, he has lost none of his skill and shrewdness. All this time, he has been a close observer of all that concerns our race. Do you know who you're dealing with? Oh, we need to move on. We go to the final one, test number seven. Test number seven is another important one, but not by itself. Keep in mind, we need to look at what? All seven tests. So when a true prophet makes a prophecy, how does that prophecy have to be fulfilled? Jeremiah 28, verse 9. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord had truly sent him. In other words, if they give a prophecy, it has to be fulfilled. Now keep in mind, sometimes there were prophets that were sent by God, but they did not give the complete message. Yeah, there were prophets like that, you know? Just think about Jonah. Jonah went there and he said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Did he get the full message? No, because after 40 days, it wasn't destroyed. J Jonah gets upset at God. He says, God, I knew you. I knew you were going to have mercy with his people. What should have he said? In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed if it does not repent. Because the prophecy was conditional upon repentance. They did repent and therefore, prophecy was still fulfilled. So sometimes, but true prophets, and, and again, Jonah had his problems, okay? So he had to be convinced even to go there and he had to go enjoy the um, smell of uh, stomach acid of a whale for a little while. But you know, sometimes uh, some of us, God tells us something to do and uh, we need to go visit the whale, don't we? Uh, have you visited your whale lately? Well, you know, that may happen. But God wants his work to be done. But here it is, the prophet, it has to come to pass. Now, in the experience of Sister White, we find that some of the prophecies that she gave were fulfilled already. Some are in the process of being fulfilled. And some prophecies are what? They are yet future. Now, she is dead, so she can't change anything about that. So what we can do is we can take a look at previous prophecies, evaluate how they were fulfilled. Then we can look at events that are happening today. And then what can we know? If everything is so far on track, what happens with the future? You better know that's going to happen as well. Let's take a look at example of spiritualism, for example. In early writings, page 43, we have a specific prophecy about spiritualism. In the early 1850s, there were some special knockings that were happening in New York State. It says here, I saw that the mysterious knocking in New York and other places was the power of Satan and that such things would be more and more common. And notice this, the prophecy here is clothed in a religious garb so as to lull the deceived to greater security and to draw the minds of God's people, if possible, to those things and cause them to doubt the teachings and power of the Holy Ghost. So what she's saying here is that this knocking, and at that time, everybody in the United States either considered it 
a, a imaginary type of knocking, or they considered it of Satan, that's all, nothing else. But she says this is actually going to increase and become what? It's going to become religious. At that time, there were no Pentecostal or charismatic churches in existence. Church organizations were not even thought of. And a little bit more, she did not stop there. She goes on in, eight, in page 87, talking about those type of things. I saw the wrapping delusion, what progress it was making. And that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. Satan will have power to bring before us the appearance of forms purporting to be our relatives or friends now sleeping in Jesus. So she's saying it's starting with this knocking type of things, but it's, it's going to eventually end up in people coming in the form of relatives and friends. It will be made to appear as if these pre friends were present. The words that they uttered while here, with which we were familiar, will be spoken. And the same tone of voice that they had while living will fall upon the ear. All this is to deceive the saints and ensnare them into the belief of this delusion. It's interesting that this was written in 1853. 1853. These mediums, what they were doing was either knocking or they used letters to spell out things by the knocks or just yes or no answers. That's all that they were doing in 1853. In 1857 to 58, four or five years later, was actually the very first, here in the United States, the beginning of materializing spirits in modern times. So four or five years before it took place, she said that this is what's going to happen. And so if you were living in the 1850s and read early writings, it would sound very far-fetched to have this type of experience. And then, a few years later, you read, people are saying, this is what's happening. I saw my grandmother after she had died. You see, that's what was happening at that time. Now let's go to another prophecy, another very important one. In the year 1861, actually... Uh, in 1861, Sister White was up here in uh, Michigan. Where is Michigan? Right up there. In Michigan. No, it's way over there. There it is. There's Michigan. <coughs> in Michigan. And she, it was Parkville, Michigan. She was holding a dedication of a church. And uh, just before that, a month before, on December 20th, 1860, the state of South Carolina had seceded from the Union. That's what happened in December 20th, 1860. So a month later, she was speaking there, and I'll tell you what she spoke in a moment, but before we do that, I want to tell you what the idea was in America at the time. In Horace Greeley, this is Horace Greeley, he was the editor of the New York Tribune. He was also trying to get into politics. I think he even ran for president at one time. Quite an influential individual in America. And after South Carolina seceded from the Union, he wrote a few things in the New York Tribune. He said, a few old women with broomsticks could go down there and beat out all the rebellion there is in South Carolina. That was his view. No big deal. A few women go down there and that's all. It's going to be old women with broomsticks. That's all they need. A, little, a week before he said about this, if someone with the firmness of Andrew Jackson should go down there and say, South Carolina, where are you going? They would reply, back into the Union, sir. That's all you need to do. That's what they thought about the Civil War. Matter of fact, at the very beginning of the Civil War, Sherman, General Sherman, he stated that it's going to be a very bad war. Terrible war. You know what they did to him? They threw him out of the army. They court martialed him, got him out of the army. Yeah, later on they brought him back in. But, but at the beginning, that was treason. How can you talk like that? It's not going to happen like that. On January 12th, this is less than a month later, so December 20th, South Carolina seceded from the Union. The ideas in America was, it's a very little thing. And in Parkville, Michigan, 
She had a vision. And look what she said. In 1893, they brought this up at the, in the General Conference Bulletin. And for those of you who know, this is, by the way, is Fort Sumter in South Carolina. It says here, there is not a person in this house who has even dreamed of the trouble that is coming upon this land. People are making sport of the secession ordinance of South Carolina. But I have just been shown that a large number of states are going to join that state and there will be a most terrible war. This is when no one joined South Carolina yet. South Carolina was alone. She says there's going to be a most terrible war. In this vision, I have seen large armies of both sides gathered on the field of battle. I heard a booming of cannon and saw the dead and dying on every hand. Then I saw them rushing up, engaging in hand, of hand fighting or bayoneting one another. Then I saw the field after the battle all covered with the dead and dying. Then I was carried to prison and saw the suffering of those in want who were wasting away. Then I was taken to the homes of those who had lost husbands, sons, or brothers in the war. I saw their distress and anguish. Anyone who ever looked anything of the history, especially down in Georgia of Andersonville and the prison that was there, the horrible situations there. And I think there was another one up in New York. The, the horrible situations in which people were dying in prison, a most terrible thing. It was interesting uh, even on the, in that occasion, by the way, this is the uh, battlefield, uh, some of the photos of the battlefield in, um, in uh, Pennsylvania, in Gettysburg, uh, up there, of how terrible that was. She went on, there are those in this house who will lose sons in that war. Now, this was a church dedication, mind you. During the church dedication, who comes? Not only church people. You had the mayor, you had all the leading officials of the town were in Parkville for that church dedication. And it was interesting that after she made this statement, they mocked her. Many of them mocked her at that time. There were at least 10 men present that day who lost sons in the war. 10. Among them, the very fathers who sneered when the vision was related. And keep in mind, contrary to all sentiments. So here's a prophet, did not take the popularist view, but actually went and described the situation thoroughly. In May 1861, 11 states had seceded. And not only did they secede from the Union by that time, but they actually elected Jefferson Davis president of the Confederacy. On April 12th, the guns were fired on Fort Sumter, the beginning of the Civil War. President Lincoln called for 75,000 men for three months to put down the rebellion. So that's all we need, 75,000 men in three months it will be over. The war continued for four years. The North would have used up 2,859,132 men. Nearly 3 million people. The South, about half as many. So what are you talking about? Three, four and a half million people, soldiers, were involved in that war. It was the most devastating war, actually. If I'm not mistaken, till today, it still holds the highest casualties of any war that the United States has ever fought, was the Civil War. So the descriptions that she made in Parkville that day were clearly fulfilled in the next few years. Now we go to the year 1885 for a moment. 1885 was... I don't know if you ever looked at some of the documentation in America in the 1880s. In the 1880s, America was strongly anti-Catholic. Very anti-Catholic. And in a time when almost the entire nation as a nation was entirely anti-Catholic, in volume 5, page 451, the prophet writes, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf 
and grasp the hand of the Roman power. This is impossible in 1885. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant Republican government, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Today, we don't look at this so strangely. When you have president after president seeking the blessing of the papacy. Can you imagine a couple years ago Pope John Paul II died. Leaders from around the world came to the funeral, including most, the president and most of the former presidents of the United States. They were there for the Pope's funeral. Except one former president. Jimmy Carter didn't go. They asked him, how come you're not going? He says, when I was president, a pope died and I didn't go. Surely I'm not going to go today. He wasn't going to go then. But every other president went there. It was amazing. The pope was flying nearby, down somewhere, my, passing through Miami or something like that. Ronald Reagan, the great conservative Protestant in America, what did he do? Flies down to have an audience with the Pope. Does that remind you of anything? And then what? Obviously with spiritualism, we'll get to that in a moment. It shall repeat every principle of its constitution as what? Both a Protestant and a Republican form of government. A Republican form of government is not a democratic government. This country is anti-democracy originally in the Constitution. It's not a democratic country. Many people get confused on this whole principle of democracy. And again, in September and October, we're going to go a little bit more in detail about it. However, I'll just give you one idea. Democracy is the idea of majority rule. When the when this country becomes a democracy and the majority rules, that is the day that you will have a national Sunday law. Why? Because the majority rules. What's keeping this country from having a national Sunday law? It's the Republican form of government, which is a government that is based on laws. Now, it is a democratic Republican form of government. What that means is that people elect their representatives and they make laws. And that is what's protecting the minority. And little by little, you are seeing this government today getting accustomed to what? Getting extremist little groups to make it sound what? We must stop protecting the minority. Little by little. So this is actually coming, we can see it a little bit more today. 1885, it was actually unheard of. So now let's go to 1904. In volume 9, page 12. Volume 9, page 12. She says, on one occasion when in New York City, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story towards heaven. So here's what she's saying, these big skyscrapers. <laughs> these buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders. By the way, some of these pictures here on the side, you may be familiar with them. You're familiar with 9-11? That's some of these pictures here. So these buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners and builders. Higher and high, still higher these buildings rose and in them the most costly material was used. Those to whom these buildings belonged were not asking themselves, how can we best glorify God? The Lord was not in their thoughts. Then we go to page 13. The scene the next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said what? They are perfectly safe. 
But these things were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. Does that sound familiar? Brethren, this is things that we see over and over again. It was interesting that um, the architect of the buildings in New York City a week earlier was actually in Germany holding a conference on high-rise safety. And in that conference, he stated that if there was an airplane, about the size of the one that hit the South Tower, if there was an airplane that hit one of those towers, it could not bring it down. One week before. That was his certification. And what happened? A week later, the buildings were no longer standing. Firemen went in. You know what? How many people were killed in that day? Over 3,000. Why only 3,000? Uh, that's a good question. Why only 3,000? Do you understand how many people go in those buildings every day? Did you know that inside those buildings, those two towers, you have over 100,000 people that do business in those buildings every single day. Did you know that? Did you know that at any given moment you can have up to 50,000 people in those two buildings? Did you know that? Yeah, there's a lot of people working. I don't know if you've ever been in there. I've been to the top of the buildings. I've been, uh, actually, I, we went to the Spanish embassy one time up there, somewhere in, the, in that place years ago. I mean, these are massive buildings when you go there and see them personally. And then, you know, I drove past it one time when it was no longer there. Uh, to see this, brethren, these are massive buildings and only 3,000 people were killed. Why? Because the angel is still holding back the four winds. Sure. There's still a time of mercy. This is why when they first began announcing, they began announcing more than 30,000 dead. That's, big, 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 yeah, that's where the, the, the announcements were. And eventually kept modifying until finally a lot of people. Yeah, I met people who actually were supposed to be in the buildings that day. And they said they lost the, they missed the train. <laughs> and didn't go in. Something happened. They didn't go in. Something, oh, someone got sick and they had to go take care of them. Many people just didn't show up that day. Why? Because of the mercy of our God. Why does God permit these tragedies? On page 12 to 13, as these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in gratifying self and provoking the envy of their neighbors. Much of the money that they had invested had been obtained through exaction, through grinding down the poor. They forgot that in heaven an account of every business transaction is kept. Every unjust deal, every fraudulent act is there recorded. The time is coming when in their fraud and insolence men will reach a point that the Lord will not permit them to pass, and they will learn that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. So as we consider these last two tests, for any prophet that fails to qualify, it means what? Zero light in them. You don't pick and choose which test. No. What do you do? Take all of them, and that's the test we have to give to them. And this is why, as we look at the writings of Ellen G. White, we need to make a decision ourselves personally. I find so many wishy-washy ideas about what these writings are. In volume 4, page 230, it's very clear. My work for the past 30 years bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. There is no halfway work in the matter. The testimonies are of the Spirit of God or of the devil. That's a choice we have to make. Is it from God or is it from the devil? You can't sit there and say, oh, I'll pick this part. This part's of God, but this is her own opinion. You want to do that? You're going down the wrong track. It's very clear. It either is from God or is of the devil. Let's just take a few moments here. I do want to cover this briefly here. The purpose of the spirit of prophecy. The major reason for a prophet is to warn the church of what's going to happen. I really enjoy the experience of Elisha and the Syrians. In 2 Kings 6, 8 through 12, it says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. 
Now just look at this. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou not pass not such and such a place, for thither are the Syrians come. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there now once or twice. So quite a few times, you know, the Syrians are getting ready. This is where the battle is. And uh, the king of Israel says, oh, okay, there he is over there. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, how does he know? The prophet tells him, hey, that's where it's going to be. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's the traitor among us? He got his counsel together. We got a traitor in our midst. Who is that traitor? And one of his servants said, None, my lord the king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel. Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Can you imagine the uh, king of Syria in his bedchamber goes there and says, Okay, now I'm going to do this. And as soon as he says, I'm going to do this, the king of Israel knows. Why? Oh, that's better than all the secret service and all the espionage in the world. Can you imagine if in your life you could know the future to protect yourself? That's what God is offering us here. If we look at the spirit of prophecy, you know, it's amazing how many people hurt themselves over nothing. A little bitty little thing and they trip over and they break their leg. You know that? But what happens if you know everything that's in front of you? Even in the dark. What would you do? It'd be quite simple. You just walk there and just walk right over it. That's what God is doing. That is the purpose of the spirit of prophecy. This is why God gave it to us as testimonies for his people. Do you want to have that protection? So, as we read the writings of Ellen G. White, we find out that she's there to warn the churches of the devices and schemes of Satan. Our church is faced with serious attacks. But can you imagine if you know them in advance? <laughs> what happens? We know they're coming and you get ready for it. Yes, it's quite that easy. She points out the way of escape also. It's not just to point out this is the danger, but what else? This is how you get out of it. This is how you become protected. Do you want to protect your soul? Then you need the spirit of prophecy. You see, in 2 Timothy 3, 1, it tells us, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Do you know we're living in dangerous days? Yes, we're facing so many da dangers all around the place. The devil wants to destroy the church of God. His whole purpose is to destroy God's people. And if you're one of them, he wants to destroy you. Amen. Isaiah 59, 19 and 20. So what do we need? It says, So shall they... Fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood. So here's the enemy coming in like the flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against it. Can you imagine that? There's a standard that He lifts up against it. And God wants us to have that. God wants us to be prepared for that. And a couple more points. There's another tool as in the days of Elisha. In 1 Corinthians 2, 28... Sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We find here that God has different things in the church. It says, And God had said some in the church, first whom? And secondarily what? <coughs> Prophet. Why are prophets secondary, not first? Why are apostles or ministers first? Why are they listed here first? And it says first. Not just listed first, but first. They need to test the prophets. Yes, that's one thing. But there's another important reason here. Do you know what the major work of ministers are? And sometimes we forget that. To teach whom? Which people? Who? You take a look at the major reason for ministers. Their purpose is, and the Spirit of God is very clear on it. This is not to sit in churches that have members. Members always say, we need a minister to preach to us. We say hear this over and over again. And she writes, that's not the work of the minister. The work of the minister is to do what? To open new fields, to go to new areas, to bring in new souls. And even in local churches you have members. The minister's work is to do what? To go out and reach new souls. 
That's why in Adventism, when it was begun, there was no ministers for local churches. That's where they ordained elders and everything else to take care of local churches. They had ministers for evangelistic outreach. Now, as ministers do evangelistic outreach, that's number one. They, ministers bring people in. Once they are in, who takes care of the local, of the members next? Yes, but who's next? Prophets. Take a look at this statement here. Just look at this. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for whom? For them that believe. Now, as we look at the work of ministers, they have the work of evangelism, they have the work of administration. There's various things that they have to do. However, their main work is for evangelistic outreach. And it's the work of prophets then to serve them that believe. The question is, are you making use of the prophets? I have found people join the church. They join the church and a little while later they're out of the church. And some of these people, I look at them and they say, oh, you, you baptize them too quickly. I've had people we study with for seven years. And they join the church and three months later they're gone. And then I had another case, you know, we're getting things ready for a baptism and all of a sudden, this 85-year-old lady, she says, oh, I'm getting baptized at the baptism. It's like, she just started coming to church. What do I do with this lady? I mean, we didn't even have a chance to study with her. The baptism's a few weeks away. What do we do with her? And the whole church, we took her to the church. They said, yeah, she's ready for baptism. So, How could she be ready for baptism? What do I do? Well, I, I went to interview her. There was no real reason not to baptize her. But what? Well, I told my wife, I said, okay. We baptize her. She'll leave in a few weeks. Okay, fine. What else can I do? <laughs> so we baptized her, and she's not leaving anywhere. She's there for years. Amen. And she's sitting there, and every time we're having a church business meeting, and all these ideas are coming around, she's always on the right track. Said, What's the difference? You know what the difference was? She was reading the Spirit of Prophecy regularly. And these others, they may have had all the studies they want, but they're not making use of the prophet. Amen. The prophet stabilizes a person. Amen. And her life, even before this, yeah, may, she may not have had certain studies, but she understood the Spirit of Prophecy. And she remained a faithful member. So after the apostles have done their work, then follows the work of what? of the prophets. Many times I baptize someone and they say, oh, you've been giving me all these Bible studies this year and now you leave me alone. Now I need to have more Bible studies. I said, now it's time for you to read the prophets. And would you like me to give Bible studies in your home? They said, yes, fine. Then bring non-members there and I'll come and visit and study with you there, okay? <laughs> That's how I will take care of it. My job is with non-members, okay? Yeah, we visit the members sometimes. Yes, I understand that. That's part of the pastoral work as well. But that's not our main work. So if a member wants visitations, very simple, organize a Bible study and I'll be there. And I had plenty of experiences like that. I had this one, um, uh, one person who was asking me questions. She was a member, but she was actually leaving the church. And uh, she wanted me to give Bible studies to her son. So I came there and then as I was giving studies, she came and listened in. And the next thing I know, she's back in church and she's back into everything. Really, praise the Lord. It helped her out too, to go out and work. But then you have the work of the prophets. The work, their work is for counseling, encouraging, and building up of the church. Ephesians 4.12 is very specific, although this includes everyone, but including the prophets, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Sister White's areas actually expand a lot more in many areas of Bible truth. One such area is education. You know, Samuel established the schools of the prophets. These students from these schools were called the sons of the prophets. Elijah reestablished those schools after they had gone into decay. And then uh, he had such a concern for these schools. Can you imagine Elijah's work? We talk about the Elijah message, standing before the king, standing up before all these wicked things. But did you know where the last place he visited before he left this earth? The was the schools. His concern was those schools. And he kept going around those schools. Do we have such a concern for those schools? He kept going and going and going. And when he left, it was from a school that he left. And then what? The next prophet that came after him that he anointed, what was their responsibility? Go back to them schools. 
Yeah, that's the work that they did. And Sister White's influence on education is so great that if you look at the books, Education, Counsel the Parents, Teachers, and Students, Fundamentals of Christian Education, fabulous books. Many of us have not read them. Many of us who have children have not read them. I tell you one thing. If the principles that were found in those books were followed by our forefathers, both in Adventism and among us, we would not be here today. We'd be in Canaan. Matter of fact, if we would truly accept all those principles, it would revolutionize our entire organizational structure, the way we work. Look at this statement here. In Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 53. Now, as never before, we need to understand the true science of education. If we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Brethren, do we understand this? If we don't understand those principles of education, we're never going to have a place in God's kingdom. Do you want to be saved? Amen. You better get out those books. Take a look at what's written in those books. Because there has to be a change in the way we think. Now, another quick one here is the Bible's concern for the health. 3 John 1, 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. So health is going to be a very important aspect of the message that we have. So we can expect a modern prophet to have many things on the subject of health reform. Her first vision on health was June 6th, 1863 in Oswego, Michigan. Covered healthful living, disease and its cause, drugs and its effects. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg wrote of the health message as given by Sister White. We're not going to read the foreword there, but you should take the book Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene. It was published in 1890. The introduction there is written by John Harvey Kellogg. And he writes there some important points, and I'm not going to read all this right now, but he talks about the principles of health. He says that uh, at the pr at when these principles were written down, few people believed them. The scientific community was against them. But even by 1890, those principles that were found were actually what? Proved by science. And it's just amazing to me. Uh, my wife is involved in the medical missionary work. And how many times she keeps finding articles of new research <laughs> that proves what was written by our prophet that we had for so many years. We have been blessed with a wealth of knowledge. And what are we doing? We're not making use of it. No wonder many times we are sick spiritually and we're dying. Many times people tell me, Oh, I'd like to be a little bit strengthened spiritually. Well, start reading the prophets. Now this is not even the mention about prophecy. This is not even the mention about biblical principles of interpretation. There's so many doctrinal divisions among people because they don't understand how to research. And they come up in different ways of conclusions. The spirit of prophecy tells us how to come to a united conclusion. What about history? What about in public speaking? What about in finance? Marital relationships? Child rearing? Management? Mental health? And science? And those of you who think child guidance is everything she has to say about uh, uh, child rearing, don't, don't think that. Matter of fact, child guidance unfortunately is skewed many times in the wrong direction. Uh, I suggest, one time what we did is we took the book Child Guidance and read it and as you're reading at the end of each uh, section they, it told you where the original article was found. And we went and read the original article and many times the, the uh, thing was taken out of its context. The original article brought it in a bright context and we were able to apply that. That's what we need to do. Look at what she actually writes on the subject itself. So as we come to our conclusion for this particular morning study that we've had because the next study actually is going to be the Omega of Apostasy. And you'll be surprised as you look at the Omega what it actually is. Over the years I've attended many Bible studies and sermons on what the Omega of Apostasy is and they're missing the point. I want to look at what the Spirit of Prophecy actually pinpoints as the Omega and we'll cover that in the afternoon. Now, again, as we mentioned last night, many people, as we give them the books of the Spirit of Prophecy, what do they say? Yeah, when I read her books or articles, it seems as if she's inspired. That is really true, brethren. And so, as we consider 
some of these facts that we looked at this morning. I want us to go back to what we finished off with last night. The experience of Jehoshaphat, of the, the king of Judah, in the time of their crisis. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, we read this already in our key text, in the scripture reading. It says here, And they rose early in the morning, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Do you want prosperity? Amen. Do you really want spiritual prosperity? Then it's high time for us to not just have a nice beautiful shelf of these books. Not to go so far, oh, we got it on our computer. Do you actually open it up? Do you use it in your computer? Do you take it off the shelf and read it? If you do, it will change your life experience. Are you ready for a life change? Amen. Amen. Amen.